Hello and welcome to the next in our OSTR series on cutting edge methodologies. Today we're going to discuss methods for global discovery experiments in mass spectrometry. In mass spectrometry there are generally two ways that we go about performing an experiment to do large global analyses. And these are either termed DDA or DIA, with DDA representing data dependent acquisition and DIA data independent acquisition. As you can see in the figure here, in a data dependent experiment, the presence of a precursor ion triggers its isolation and fragmentation for analysis. Fragment ions have a direct linkage to the parent peptide mass, and acquisition is dependent upon the data in the mass spectrometer, hence the name data dependent. In contrast, in a data independent experiment, mass windows are cyclically isolated and scanned, with all of the ions within the window uh, fragmented simultaneously. The particular fragment ions for a given peptide have to be extrapolated out of the pool of fragment ions for all peptides in the window. Acquisition is independent of the data in the mass spectrometer, hence the name data independent acquisitions. So if we just look a little further again, what you see in a DDA experiment is that ions come into the mass spectrometer, are isolated in the quadrupole, and then analyzed in a full scan mass spectrum. Based on the ions detected there, specific ions are selected for fragmentation based on either their intensity or their charge state. And each one is individually isolated and fragmented and then analyzed again. So again, we have a direct linkage between the parent ion mass and the fragment ions that come from it. However, there is a limitation in the number of ions that can be fragmented per parent ion scan. In contrast, in the data independent scan, the ions again go into the quadrupole, a full mass spectrum is analyzed, and then sequential precursor uh, windows are isolated, and all of the ions that fall within that mass are isolated, fragmented, and a mass spectrum combined. These mass windows tend to be on the order of 4 to 25 m over z units, and so you get a combined picture of everything that's present. Nothing is lost, there's no limit on the number, but the linkage between the parent ion mass and the fragment ion mass is lost. So both methods have advantages and disadvantages. DDA experiments, again, maintain the link between the parent mass and the fragment ion spectrum, and they require only a sequence database for peptide and protein identifications. However, due to the stochastic nature of ionization, some peptides will be missed. Also, missing values replicate to replicate and across sample will affect the ability to do good quantitation, especially across multiple experiments. DIA, all experiments, all peptides, excuse me, are fragmented and can theoretically be analyzed, so there are no missing values and there's more complete quantitation and values across replicates. However, in a single fragmentation window, multiple precursors are fragmented and the direct link to the parent ion is lost. Therefore, spectral libraries are required for database searching such that the fragments can be matched to a known library, pulled out, and then continue to be searched. Optimally, these libraries should be collected on the same instrument and using the same LC conditions as the final run. So in that case, you still need some DDA experiments for every DIA experiment. Some instrument manufacturers, such as SciX, have also managed to modify the isolation windows and instead of having static windows, they offer variable window isolation. In this method, the isolation window is varied such that it's narrower in the mass ranges where there are a lot of peptides and wider in the mass range where there are fewer peptides. This means that there's higher specificity in the isolation, there's better signal to noise, and hopefully better data across the entire experiment. So within a DDA experiment, there are also different ways that one can perform quantitation to get relative information about protein abundance. First are label-free methods, such as you see on the top, in which cells are grown in normal media, the peptides, uh, proteins, excuse me, are digested to peptides, peptides are isolated and then analyzed by the mass spectrometer. Quantitation is generally performed from the parent ion mass using an extracted chromatogram, which looks a lot like an HPLC uh, profile. There's also methods such as SILAC in which cells are grown in isotopically labeled media. The media can, the cells can then be combined and digested and analyzed on the mass spectrometer. Again, we're doing quantitation of the parent ion masses 
um, from the extracted ion chromatogram, but the different states of the cell have a slightly different mass due to the isotopes, and so they can be directly compared quantitatively. There's also a third approach that's commonly used in which cell proteins are isobarically tagged. In this case, again, peptides are isolated, they're digested, and then they are reacted with a reagent that has an isobaric tag, such that the mass that gets added regardless of state is the same. Then, when the peptides are introduced to the mass spectrometer and fragmented, a reporter ion will come off with a low mass that differs depending on which form of the tag was put on the protein, whereas you can still see the peptide sequence information. There are generally two types of these tags, either TMT or ITRAC, depending on the manufacturer. The ITRAC tags come in a fourplex and an eightplex, which allows multiple different samples to be combined and analyzed at once. And TMT tags currently come up to an 11 plex. Again, 11 samples could be combined and analyzed at once. Each of these methods have different advantages and disadvantages, just like DDA versus DIA. And the way to proceed often depends upon several questions about sample and method development. First, what type of sample are you analyzing? Is this a cell line or an animal model or patient sample? Cell lines are readily amenable, for example, to the SILAC method. Um, you can get SILAC labeled chow, although it's quite expensive, and patient samples really cannot be done in a SILAC method. So in that case, either label-free or, or TMT ITRAC type methods are best. Additionally, whether the sample is a more traditional sample that one wants to look at, or for example, microbiome samples. Uh, microbiome, where one is looking at microbes in host environments, are often done using DIA methods because the identification of different microbes can be processed over time. The data can go back and be researched as different microbes of interest come up, come up for analysis. You might also want to consider how many samples are you analyzing. If there's only a few, then a SILAC or label-free approach may be good, but if there are a lot of samples being analyzed, the benefits of multiplexing with the isobaric tags come in very handy in terms of instrument and analysis time. And finally, what type of analysis are you performing? Are you looking at post-translational modifications or total protein? For total protein, as there are usually multiple peptides per protein identified, label-free approaches work well. However, for post-translational modifications, as there's usually only a single peptide with a single modification, the some form of isobaric or SILAC labeling with additional quantitation information often gives better results. So for more information about these types of methods and to think about how you could use them in your own research, please feel free to contact your local mass spectrometrist. Within the NCI, you can talk to me, Lisa Jenkins, or my colleague, Thorkel Anderson and Frederick. Within the wider NIH community, I would direct you to visit the CREX for more information about available resources. Thank you very much for your attention. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, Cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER, produced August 2019.